I am very happy to be back here in the Twin Cities and to meet several old friends and some new ones in this audience. I have come after several months and I was trying to figure out which of the two statements is true, out of sight, out of mind or the absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> seeing so many of you and uh, so many friends from across the country assembled here. I think that uh, where there is a feeling of love between people, absence does not take it away. Where there is a feeling of uh, intellectual companionship, where the minds meet, their absence can create a gap and make one forget, give less priority. Therefore, when we meet people, when we interact with them, we either do it through our minds or from our hearts and souls. When we meet people with minds, then time and separation affect our relationship. But when we meet people with heart and soul, nothing seems to affect it. Not even physical absence, not even separation. And that feeling of being there, that we are there, we are together even though we are not physically together, continues somewhere in the conscious system. Now, why should that be? Why should there be a feeling that unless you renew your relationship, renew your acquaintance, it will break on the one hand, in the case of mental relationships, and a feeling that doesn't matter where one is, how can you get rid of that person out of the system? where the relationship is based on the heart and the soul. Why are both these things true? The reason is that we are all a combination of these two. We are a combination of mind and soul. And none of us sitting here is pure soul or pure mind with none of the other. Therefore, we have a soul which sometimes is referred to as the heart. It does not refer to this heart, the cardiac heart. It refers to the heart or the one that is a non-thinking part of consciousness which relies more on feelings than on thoughts. That part, when that gets into a relationship with somebody, it doesn't matter what happens. One cannot get out of it. It grows. And that's what we really call love. Love is not a mental relationship at all. When we feel that we like somebody, we want to be in the company of somebody, we enjoy somebody, it's because of our thoughts, because of common thought patterns, because we can tune in, because we think alike, because we have common interests. That is an attachment. It's an attachment that rests on continuous nurturing by physical presence. But the love that comes from the heart does not come because of similarity of interest. It does not come because we think alike. It comes because we come from the same source. It comes because we feel an identification. It comes that when we are in the presence of somebody we love, we forget ourselves and can be that somebody else. It is this difference of being together and being one. In mental attachment, we are together. In love, we are one. We are one, not in a a philosophic or abstract sense. We are one in the sense of an experience. We are so full of our own egos, our own individual attitudes, our own individual way of looking at things. This ego, individuality, this I-ness, this trying to show off this macho game that is going on all the time, where I comes up. There is no possibility of two strong eyes meeting and making it less. But when the strongest eyes meet in love, that I is removed and you replaces the I. This is an experience. We all have it. We have met people with whom we had an intellectual companionship, an attachment. And we felt it was nice to meet somebody who thought the same way. And we liked the company. And when we didn't meet that person for a while, we forgot about that person. We had to revive our relationship. And once in a while, more rarely than attachments, we come across the experience of love. 
we come across somebody who makes us forget who we are, who makes us forget our own importance of the I, and we can focus in on the beloved, on the one we love, in a way in which we may make a mistake sometimes of thinking whether what we are talking about relates to us or to the beloved. That feeling comes from that part of our consciousness which we call the soul or the spirit. When we talk of the spiritual path, the spiritual path is the path of love, of spiritual love. The spiritual path is not a path of mental attachment. Indeed, mental attachments have come in the way of spiritual path and spiritual growth. The trouble is that the mind and the soul in each one of us are so knotted together, are in such a strange kind of a combination that unless we are alert and somebody points it out to us, we are likely to miss one for the other. And very often, I hear people talking of spiritual growth and they say, well, it all depends on growth, on the mind, soul, whatever, as if it makes no difference. Sometimes people will refer to mental activity, mental power, mind power, development of the mind, thought power, as if it is the same as spiritual power. And when they say things like that, it fails. And they wonder what's gone wrong. There's nothing wrong with the spiritual growth and love. But it should be spiritual, not mental. And we must remember that there is a distinction between mental growth and spiritual growth. Also, there are other things that the mind controls in our body which are not directly related with the spirit. For example, emotions. We often mistake emotions to be the same thing as love. We get sentimental, emotional about something. And something happens to us in certain parts of the body which give us a feeling we are high, we are filled up, something great is going on. If you carefully notice where that is happening, you will find it is happening in certain centers in the body, which we in the East have often referred to as the six chakras, the six energy centers, the six centers for emotional energy. And all the emotions can be found and traced back to those six chakras. And we can be so confused about these issues as to think that knowledge of the emotional functions of the six chakras is the same thing as spiritual knowledge. And people are practicing various kinds of meditation, concentrating on those six emotional chakras and thinking that they are getting spiritual benefit out of it. When they find that all their experience with the six chakras and all their experience with emotions does not lead them to an experience of love, to an experience of annihilation of the ego, to an experience of oneness with the beloved, then they wonder, there must be something wrong with this yoga. There must be something wrong with meditation. There's nothing wrong. Just understand what's going on. Just understand that this human being, the human body consists of all these things and they are placed in the right position for special functions. Don't mistake one for the other. Don't, in a naive way, think anything that happens in consciousness Anything that comes to our awareness must be spiritual. The spiritual comes from the spirit. The mental comes from the mind. The emotional comes from the chakras. And the physical comes from the physical organs of the body. Make no mistake about it. When we want to understand spirituality, we must understand ourselves. We must understand how we function. Then we will be able to realize what resources from all these systems in the human body we are applying when we go forth in this world and we talk of love and relationship and healing and doing good to the others, how much good can one do if one is doing it based upon the emotions and the energy sources of these chakras when they themselves are depleting our own energy source? I have attended a number of workshops and seminars now in the past several years in this country and in other countries of the world. And I meet a lot of psychics, a lot of people who say we are healing. And they are relying on the energy of these chakras for healing. And one common thing I notice, that most of these healers are very sick themselves. I don't know if you have noticed it. You go around and see. They need more healing than the people they are trying to heal. And what has happened to them? I have seen lots of them. They should glow with health. 
They should glow with energy. They should glow with spirituality and love. They should affect us from a distance. But no, they have to make all the passes. They have to lay the hands. They have to do various things and use all the psychic powers and deplete themselves and say, this is spiritual healing we are doing. Where is the spirit involved? If you use psychic powers from the lower chakras, if you use these energies which are meant to be energies arising from different parts of the body, you can't call it spiritual healing. There is no other spiritual healing except healing with love. And there is no other love except the love that flows from the soul and the spirit of a human being. There is no such thing. Let's not misuse these words. Let's not call these attachments as love. Let's not call these mental games, ego games as love. You hear people talk about it. I love you. I love you here. I have to say it ten times to convince you that I love you. Do you think that is love? You need so much reassurance. And then you must tell me, do you love me? If you don't say you love me, I am in doubt. What kind of love have I? And if you say, no, but I hate you, then I who loved you a minute ago will say, then I also hate you. This is the kind of love. These are mental games. These are games arising from our thoughts. Thoughts are those words and sentences we are pouring constantly into the conscious stream to make use of the mind. Mind is a wonderful thing. I'm not decrying or condemning the mind. It's a wonderful thing. Make good use of it. But make use of it for the purpose for which it is designed. Don't start making use of it in place of the spirit or the soul. It cannot replace it. There is no way. When you use the mind, use it under your instructions. If you instruct the mind to do something, it does a good job. But if you tell the mind, what shall I do? It does a very poor job. It does a bad job. It will ruin you. People who consult their mind on their lives are in a mess today. But people who have told their mind what to do are on top of the world today. The mind is a very good servant, but a very bad friend or a master. Don't make the mind your master. Be the master yourself. Now this looks like a very simple prescription. Be the master yourself. But aren't you the master yourself? No, not till you can find out who you are and what the mind is. So long as you think it's the same thing, it's very difficult to know who you are and who the mind is. That is why the spiritual pursuit of truth has always been find out who you are. Find out your own self. Discover your own self. Know your own self. Be your own self. Look, such a strange thing that we who are ourselves should be told to be ourselves. The truth is we are not ourselves. Supposing I come here and think this jacket I am wearing is myself. True, I am wearing a jacket. But if I start calling this as myself, I am making some mistake somewhere. And the moment I insist on saying, this is me, you can understand how many mistakes I will make, what mess I will create, how many misunderstandings I will create, how much unhappiness I will generate for myself and for others, just by going on insisting, I am the jacket. People will say, it's crazy, he's a fool, leave him aside. But we are doing precisely that when we go around this world and say, this body is me. And we keep on claiming that this body is me. My name is so and so. The name given to the body is being taken on as my name. We are not acknowledging that the body is just being worn by us, by the self, in the same way like we wear a jacket. That the body is temporarily being worn. That we are wearing this body not for our total length of time that we are here. We are here for Im eternity, immortality. How can this body be ourselves when we are immortal? When the soul, the spirit, consciousness, our conscious entity is immortal, has been there all the time, will be there all the time. The body has not been there all the time. How can this be us? And yet, when we start not only believing that this is us, but start telling others, and make our relationships based upon this assumption that the body is us, we make a mess of everything. But if we realize that the body is a temporary vehicle, a temporary cover, we are using it, then we can make good use of it, enjoy it. It has got such wonderful things. I have not seen a better creation, a better invention, 
a better product in this whole creation around us, in this whole universe as this human body. It is so great. It's the best thing that was ever made. And yet, just by not knowing what it is, we are making no use of it. By thinking that is us, we make no use of our body. But by knowing who we us, the conscious beings inhabiting this body, living inside this body, we can make excellent use of this body. What is the use we can make of this body? From childhood, we can grow up knowing it's a wonderful thing to bring up, make it healthy, make it in good shape, keep it in good shape all the time, thinking we have to make good use of it, enjoy, have all the pleasures, the joys that are filled up in this body and then discover all the hidden treasures which lie inside. Did you know what are the hidden treasures inside? Some, sometimes people don't even believe me when I tell them the truth. That this body, this physical body, if we knew it is just a cover containing a lot of hidden treasures inside, if I tell them just a little inkling of what it contains, they don't believe me. I tell them it contains the whole of this creation that you see outside, inside. You can have access from inside this body to experience anything that has ever been created outside. You can travel anywhere you like in this so-called external world that you perceive with your senses by being inside the body. The controls that enable you to experience any part of creation exist within the body. The whole of creation which looks outside is inside the body. Not only that, the creator himself who made the whole scheme is inside the body. Not only that, your own self, the real self, the one that Socrates said fine is also inside the body. Every good thing that you can ever look forward to seeing is inside the body. Do we look inside the body for all this? No. We say body is me, it was born, it will die. I don't know what to do with it. It's limp, it's sick, it needs healing. You go to doctors, you go to healers, you do everything. You put all kinds of uh, rotten stuff in, into it. And when you feel that thoughts are going into it, you put rotten thoughts also into it. What respect do we give? And yet, we say there have been some spiritual leaders, there have been masters who have taught us about the truth of this body. They came and proclaimed openly that this body is not merely made of flesh and bones and tissues. This body houses the kingdom of God. It is inside this body. This body houses not only the ability to go and see what is outside, but the ability to find out what is really our own kingdom. This body contains the source of all happiness. That if you feel miserable and you want to overcome misery and unhappiness, the answer will never be found outside, but will always be found inside this body. When this kind of information is available to us, do we treat it like the temple that it's supposed to be? Do we treat it like the house of God? We make temporary structures outside with bricks and stones and give them the name of house of worship, house of God and observe so much sanctity there. Keep it clean and nice and don't want to create any noise, any pollution. Say this is the house of the Lord and the real house of the Lord where he's actually sitting and residing inside. We pollute without bothering about it. And yet we say, we have found out the truth of this body. We haven't found the truth at all. And that is why all this mistake about identification or misidentification with the cover as our self creates these problems. Therefore, if one wants to find out what is spiritual, what is really the soul, one can find out without going anywhere else. People say, is there a place we can go to where we can find the truth about the soul? And I say, yes, there is a place you can go to and find the soul. And that is inside your body. So you don't have to travel anywhere. You travel with the body and go outside. Stop traveling and go inside. And you will find the truth about your soul, which is inside. Therefore, when we mistake the covers to be ourselves, we create all the problems we have had so far. This body cover is not so bad because we can see after a while that after all, this body has such a short life. It came, we grow old and we die. We see people dying. We see people going all the time. So many of our friends have gone. Some of them never even, even gave us a chance to say goodbye. They just left. 
and so many are coming. So we know something about the nature of this human body, the physical body and its temporary structure. But when we begin to think that our senses and our feelings and our emotions, these are real, it makes things even worse. How could they be real? What are sense perceptions? When we say we can see with eyes, we can hear with the ears, we can do these things with our hands and walk with feet and taste with the tongue. When we claim these things of sense perceptions, motor perceptions and input sensory perceptions, when we talk of these things, we forget we are again talking of a cover. Consciousness is the ability to be aware. Senses are tools which we use to become aware. Just like the body is a tool. Therefore, the senses are as much a cover as the body. So we can make a big mistake there. Therefore, we have to be cautious that if we misplace our identity on the body or the senses, we are making a mistake. But the worst mistake takes place. The greatest blunder we have made, which has made it difficult for us to see the truth, is when we start thinking we are the mind. When we start identifying ourselves with the mind, the mental process, the process of thoughts. I think so, therefore that's me. How many times have we not said this to ourselves? I think like that. And thereby, we immediately become the mind. Have we ever said, my mind had a strange thought today? I have not seen too many people say that. But that's the truth. The truth is, all thoughts that are going inside our head, inside this body, inside our self, are being generated by the mind. The truth is, the mind is a cover like this physical body. The truth is, there is no difference in the separation of a cover from the reality as between the body and the soul or the mind and the soul. All the thoughts that go into us and we think that's us is as great an error as saying this body is us. And yet all the time we, figure, we are trying to figure out if we are not thoughts, if it is not the soul that is thinking, who is thinking? And if the mind is something other than me, thinking these thoughts, what am I doing? Well, sometimes uh, I give a little ex experience to people in workshops when I tell them that when they are in meditation, with their eyes closed, watching the thought process going on, they will notice that two things are happening simultaneously. There is somebody speaking in the head, which is the thought. And that speaker is the mind. There is somebody listening to that too. Otherwise, you won't know somebody is speaking. How can you know somebody spoke unless somebody heard? The mind is the speaker and the soul is the listener. You want to find out the difference? Any one of you can do it. Do it tonight. Go home, sit quietly. The moment you try to sit quietly, the mind will be speaking. Because mind never stops speaking. And his mind dreads quiet. Let me tell you this. The mind is afraid of nothing more than quiet. In fact, some mystic said that if you want to find the truth, the easiest way is to become quiet. The mind will run, do everything possible, reveal its identity, and you will find out that you are not the mind, but the soul. Why? Because when you are sitting by yourself, with your eyes closed, just by yourself, you can listen to your thoughts. And you can immediately know that the one that is speaking is the mind and the one that is listening is the soul. But is that the only distinction? No, there are many more distinctions. The one that speaks needs time to speak. You can't speak without time. The thoughts come and even the smallest thought that takes place in the human consciousness takes some time. One minute, half a minute, one second, half a second, one tenth of a second. It takes some time to utter any thought. The smallest thought takes time. But the listener takes no time at all. The listener only listens in whether the time is there or not. Not only that, there are certain things the listener is doing independently of the speaker. One of the things the listener is doing independently of the speaker is called intuition. Hunch. A feeling of knowledge not coming from speech. A feeling of knowing something in which you have not thought about it. You may think of one thing and something else comes through without words and you know it. I know. How? I don't know how. Where? I don't know from where. But it came. Has anyone of you had that experience? 
of an intuitive flash of a of a hunch of a gut knowledge appearing in you without your knowing where it came from because it did not come from your thoughts if any one of you has had please raise your hand let me see if there's somebody fine wonderful i'm in good company that intuitive feeling does not require time in fact there is no true intuition which takes time if you want to know is this a mental game my mind is playing or is it real intuition the answer is if it takes time to spell out what it is telling it is not intuition it's a mental game if it comes like a flash from nowhere with no time it's pure intuition therefore the soul's experience does not take time but intuition is not the only thing that comes so suddenly another thing that comes suddenly is love have you had experience when love can come so suddenly that it gave you no time to think about it even that you thought of it after it came not before it came when you have an attachment a cultivation of relationship with somebody you will notice it takes time because the mind is working on a time frame but when there is love for somebody it comes instantaneously from nowhere because it is a spiritual experience let me remind you all love is a spiritual experience it's not love for a particular individual that is spiritual or love for god that is spiritual or love for this or that that is spiritual love per se is spiritual love is spiritual love period is spiritual the experience of love the experience of love as a soul experience is spiritual whoever has had it has had spiritual experience an atheist can have a spiritual experience if that atheist has experience of love therefore love is the reality of our spirit and love is natural to us it doesn't come because you cultivate it attachments are cultivated the mental game of knowing somebody developing a friendship and acquaintance that is an unnatural thing it is developed by the mind and is not like love but when love comes how do you feel when love comes do you know the sign of it the first sign when you have experience of love for another person for another being you are here and you have a feeling of love for somebody what's the first experience you have the first experience is as if you are feeling that which the other person is feeling that's the very first experience the caring for the other person you want to care for the person as if that person was more important than you the human ego does not allow priority to anybody else except oneself when one wants to care for people mentally by thinking about it one cares in a patronizing way keeping oneself in that position i have great sympathy for that person i would like to help i want to help people putting oneself on a pedestal as if one can help one has the resource and the others need help that's all mental game there is no love involved in that but when you have the experience of love you forget where you are you forget if you can help or not your mind is how that person is thinking feeling doing this automatic identification with the beloved is the first sign of love it's natural the spiritual function if you can do that it's wonderful because you will find when you can express that kind of love of identifying with another keeping your own ego out of the way you can heal that person better than any any other way people have tried to heal people by using mental forces by using psychic powers by using the powers of the chakras by tantric powers by various kinds of beings and they have ended up in creating doubts creating some palliatives some calm some compassion but not given the kind of healing that love can give where people mistakenly have thought that we are using psychic powers but actually they are in love with the subject actual healing has taken place not because of the psychic powers but because of love love was the healer not the psychic powers but they mistook it they didn't know how to distinguish it nobody ever told them that psychic powers do not create love nobody ever told them that love originates from the soul not from thoughts not from mind not from senses not from chakras not from the body that it is only the soul and spirit of a human being that is the source of all love and love is the source of real healing because when you can identify with another person then you can have the experience of that other person there is a very interesting observation made by a scientist who is examining the nature of manifest matter that this matter 
which has been manifested here. Now, we are all examples of manifest matter. Manifest matter in the form of molecules, atoms, protons, electrons, neutrons. This manifest matter, we keep on analyzing it and finding minuter and minuter units of this matter. And we say ultimately it's not the electron. Maybe there's a smaller unit. Neurons, maybe there's still smaller unit. We don't know. We, maybe we have to find out the smallest units which are flowing so fast that we can't trap them. But whatever unit we are aware of at any time, a thought has come that if the two units of matter of any form could be put together in the same place in space, what would happen? It's a good question asked. If you could put, supposing this is a microphone here, we had another microphone and we could by some strategy put both the microphones exactly at the same place in space and time which means we put it exactly at the same place in space at the same time, what would happen? The present guess is a pretty good guess by most of the scientists and the speculators and philosophers that if these two were put together identically at the same time, two things which are identical put together, both will disappear. Now they said if this is true, it's very difficult to put these two together because we don't know how to do it. Can we try it with something other than matter? Can we try with a thought? Supposing we have a thought and we put an identical thought in the same place in our head and both put together, what will happen? They both disappear. Have you ever tried it? You can try it. And it actually worked, thereby giving some credence to the theory that if two created manifest forms in this physical universe were put together, they would disappear. That they are arising in plurality, giving rise to the theory of matter and antimatter, giving rise to the theory that when you create anything which has electrons, negative charge particles moving outside, there must be a counterbalance with the similar particles where the positive charge electrons are moving outside, the positrons are moving outside. All these theories are coming up based upon this assumption being made that in this manifest form, you cannot manifest anything except in a certain pattern. And when you put them together, you can lead to something which the Buddhists called nothingness, shunna. They said nothingness does not mean emptiness. Nothingness means everything. Because everything that you see manifest has come from nothing. Therefore, nothingness should not be equated with emptiness. Nothingness is the source of all manifest form of creation. They went further. And they said that nothingness should not even be taken as space unless space is considered as the origin of all things that have happened. You will see some of you, maybe scientists, interested in this knowledge which is now being investigated. In the coming years, you will find greater awareness coming about gravity and about space. Space not as simple emptiness between objects, but space as the source of manifestation of those objects. Space not as that which can create a dimension, but space as that which creates the very objects which lead to dimensions. These are new ideas which will come up, but which have been explored and commented upon by those who understood the nature of manifestation itself, how these forms are manifest. So when you look at these different types of energy to which we can have access, you will find there is nothing unnatural going on. The very simple rules of manifestation going on and the psychic energies and various kinds of tantric magical things that are happening, the so-called miraculous powers that people possess is nothing but a very natural law being followed. Just because we have not reached that stage of intellectually understanding what is going on, we might think this is also great miracle happening spiritually. There is nothing spiritual about it. These are natural laws and try to understand them. Somebody has asked me, which is the best source book? Which is the best library? The best text one can get all this information from? And I have said, there's a very good book in several volumes. In fact, in endless volumes. And it is a book well known to many people in this country. Because I hear the name here. It's slightly differently pronounced in this country than in India. And it's called the Akashic Records. Anybody heard of it? We call it the Akashic Records. Akash 
and you pronounce it as a keshit, probably to sound it more with your words. What? That's a good book. You want to get the information, read that book. Don't read any other book. Because all the information is there in that book. About all the things that I talk about. And all the things that other people talk about. And all the lectures you have ever heard. And all the lectures you will hear and sport. They are all there. So if you want to read a book. And you want to go to the source. For getting your material. Read that. Where is it? Where is that Akashic record? That book of records. Which contains the records of all the knowledge. Past, present and future. Well, don't get startled. It's all lying inside each one of you. Available for per user. Inside the head of each one of you. And you can have access to it. Now the point is, why don't we read it? If it is so simple. The reason is that where it is written, the script of it is on a plane which is the mind stretched out into a region of experience called the causal region. The mental region. It is called the causal region because it causes all manifestation to take place according to the script on that book. When we go and see a play, the play is going according to the script. But we don't read the script. Supposing we started reading the script and then saw the play, we, half the fun is gone. Therefore, even in this play of this world, when we are in this world as spectators, as witnesses, as participants in this great play of life, we find this is going on according to the script already written on the Akashic records. But we don't go and read the script, we enjoy the show. Sometimes we become miserable because of the show. But I have seen people crying in theatres. I said, why are you crying? He said, look what that fellow is doing. I said, that's only a screen. Those are only pictures made by a projector. But they still cry. Have you ever cried in a movie? Any one of you? Whoever has cried, they raise their hands. I'm the first one. Don't we know it's unreal? But we still cry. It's not necessary for it to be real. It's according to the script. It's, even they are not actually doing what they are doing. We still cry. We still go through the emotions. We identify ourselves with those players because we like it. We pay five, six dollars to go and cry. <laughs> no wonder we came here to do the same things. We come to enjoy, to laugh, to cry, and we are going according to the script. That is why people can't understand how can there be predetermination. Don't we have free will? If we have free will, then there can't be a script. Then we must be having some part in rewriting the script when we like. So we wrote the script in the first place, so we have full free will. We wrote it, we acted it, we come back to see it. So obviously we have full free will. But when we wrote the script, we wrote as authors. When we enacted the drama, we did it as producers. When we told the actors what to do, we were directors. Now we have become actors, we can do nothing about the script. <laughs> we have to follow the script. Where do we change these roles? And is it possible for a human being to change the role? Certainly. We can change the role when we are in the physical body and think, this is us, we are mere actors. We lost all control. Everything is predetermined. If we think we are nothing but this physical body, and the free will that we are having is because of how we think, then we are totally helpless and going according to the script. When we say, I can change this, I'll do this or that, this kind of talk of free will is a great insult to our intelligence. Because when we are asked to do something, we ultimately do what we are programmed to do. A friend of mine in Harvard, I sometimes tell this story, who, who came to me one day with a great discovery. Eureka, he said. Eureka, I found out. The greatest truth. And I was very happy to see a friend of mine. We studied together and he was searching for the real truth and he found out the truth. So I said, what is it? He said, I found out the truth. We have no free will at all. That's the truth. And he was very happy because for the first time he realized there is God. Because he found that if we have some free will, there can be no God. It was a very simple deduction that he made. He found that if there is a God who is omniscient, omnipotent, who knows everything, who writes everything, who knows in advance what we will do, then we can have no free will. 
And if we have even a little free will, God is ignorant about that. Therefore, he cannot be God. Therefore, the fact that he discovered the truth, we have no free will, made him realize there is God and made him a worshiper. He was very happy. But his happiness was short-lived when I gave him a cup of tea and coffee on a tray and said, my friend, will you have tea or coffee or nothing? Tell me without using your free will because you don't have any. <laughs> and he thought about it. He said, how can you demolish this great truth just with a cup of coffee and tea? <laughs> I said, the truth is worse than what you are expecting. The truth is you have to use free will whether you like it or not. If you say no, then also it's free will. If you say yes, it's still free will. If you say I don't want coffee, it's your free will. When you came to me and said I have found out we have no free will, you said out of your free will. You could have said I have free will. In fact, we are trapped in free will. You cannot get out of it. Every moment that we walk and we move, we are on free will. If we didn't have this feeling of free will, where would be the law of karma? How can one create karma? Where would be the law of morality? How could one sin if one has no free will? If you have no choice, there is no good and evil at all left. Therefore, free will has caught us in its trap. And then if free will is so real, it has trapped us like this, then what's happening to God? But he's just silently watching what his crea creation is doing. Gone out of control. That he created something out of his will. And that creation took over the will and began to have its own free will. And the creator began to look helplessly. Is that the scene? It doesn't look like it. So what is the truth? The truth is, of course, very startling and cannot be understood unless we know ourselves. The truth is that the God who has full free will, who is in full control at all times, who writes the script, wrote the script, will write the script, and the individual human being who is helpless and claiming to have free will are the same. 